Now, I first thought the two kids who did this came from someplace else. Well, when I learned that they had grown up in Laramie, I was just floored. In Laramie, Wyoming, a young man is in a deep coma near death from a savage beating. When I first found out, I just thought it was horrible. Nobody deserves that. I don't care who you are. A college freshman was beaten, tied to a fence, and left for dead in Wyoming this week. Certainly, you'd like to think this was somebody from out of town. Somebody who comes through and beats somebody up. But if we're talking about somebody who's been beaten repeatedly by somebody from our town, that certainly offends us. If you asked me before, I would have told you, you know, Laramie is a beautiful town. It's secluded. You know, secluded enough so you can have your own identity. You know, now, after Matthew, I, you know, we're a town defined by an accident or a crime, you know. We become Waco or Jasper, you know. We're a noun or a definition or a sign. Do you mind if I tape this? No, I don't mind. Okay, great, thank you. And thank you again for taking time out of your rehearsal to talk to me. I must tell you, when I first heard you were thinking of coming here, when you first called me, I wanted to say, you just kicked me in the stomach. Why are you doing this to me? And then I thought, well, that's stupid. You're not doing this to me. And more importantly, my students need to talk. When this first happened, they started to talk about it, and then the media descended, and all dialogue stopped. Well, we're not reporters. I know. I read your last play. You did? Mm-hmm. Gave me an idea of what you do. Moises called, saying he had an idea for his next theater project, but there was a somberness to his voice. So I asked him what it was all about, and he said he may want to do a piece about what's happening in Wyoming. Lee called me, and told me that the company was thinking of going down to Laramie and conducting some interviews, and did I want to come? I did. I said, yeah, but I, 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 I was hesitant because uh, as a gay man, I mean, a kid had just been killed there because he was gay. What exactly do you want? Well, I'd like you to give me names of people who might want to talk to us. And I'd like to talk to your students and your friends. I want to hear from the people of the town. I have never done anything like this before. How do you get people to talk to you? What do you ask? It's still very raw for us here. I understand, but this is no longer about Laramie or Wyoming. This is about the whole country. To me, it's still about Laramie. The company has agreed to come to Laramie and interview the people of the town, and I am scared because I don't know what I'm going to do about trying to ensure their safety. I made a preliminary contact with Rebecca Hillerker, who's the head of the theater department at the University of Wyoming, and hopefully that will lead to more interviews. Hey, you're late. I know. We talked for a lot longer than I planned. So what did Rebecca say? Look, she gave me names of a bunch of people who might talk to us, townspeople and ranchers and students, so we should try and contact these people first. Well, let's see if anybody's going to talk. Are you okay? What? Please don't do that here. Where are you folks from? New York. New York. And uh, what brings you to town? We're just passing through. <laughs> Is Linda home? No, she's working. 
Okay, well, can you tell her that Amanda stopped by and I'll be at the Ranger Motel? And who are you? Well, I'm with the theater company. Rebecca Hilliker told her about me. I never heard of her. What do you want? Well, I'm with the theater company and we're writing a play about Laramie and the Matthew Shepard incident. Why are you doing that? Well, we think it's a story that... Well, you're sticking your nose into something we don't need to talk about anymore. That's over and done. I, I understand your, your feeling. We, we don't want any more of this. You're not wanted here. Where are you going with this story? Well, when the play's finished, we're going to bring it around to Laramie. And you're going to use our words? That's the idea. <clears throat> well, I've been close enough to the case to know many of the people. I have a daughter who works in the sheriff's department. As for the gay issue, uh, I don't give a damn one way or another, as long as they don't bother me. And even if they did, I'd just say no thank you. And that's the attitude of most of the Laramie population. Mm -hmm. They might poke one in a bar situation. You know, they've been drinking. They might actually smack one in the mouth, but then they just walk away. Laramie is live and let live. My dear brothers and sisters, I am here today to bring you the word of the Lord. In my ministry, I found a simple truth that I'd like to share with you today, and it's this. The word is either sufficient or it is not. Now, scientists tell me that human history, that the world is five billion or six billion years old. After all, what's a billion years, give or take? <laughs> but the Bible tells me that human history is 6,000 years old. The word is either sufficient or it is not. In Laramie, population 26,687. The first thing to greet us was Walmart. This could be any main drag in America, fast food chains, gas stations. But as we drove into the downtown area by the railroad tracks, the building still retained the shape of a turn of a century Western town. Oh, and as we passed the University Inn on the sign where amenities such as heated pool or cable TV are usually touted, it said, hate is not a Laramie value. How did you wind up here? Well, um, when it came time to go to college, my parents uh, couldn't really afford to send me to college. So um, I knew that I wanted to study theater, and but I knew that if I wanted to go to college, I had to get on a scholarship. So there's this uh, um, like competition they have every year. It's like a Wyoming State High School competition thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I came to the university, um, to the theater department, to look for some good scenes, right? And I asked the professor, I said, um, I need a killer scene. And he's like, here, there you go. This is it. What was it? That was Angels in America. I read that, and I'm like, this, this is OK. I can win best scene if I just do a good enough job, you know? So I tell my parents, you know, so they can come see me in the competition. And they brought me in the room, and they sat me down, and they said that they wouldn't come to see me if I did that scene. They couldn't. Why is that? You know, because they because they believe it's wrong, because homosexuality is wrong, you know? And um, all I remember from the competition is just standing ovation. Oh, really? Just, that's right. <laughs> we won, we got first place. It's one of the best moments of my life, just, you know? So did your parents come? Parents weren't there. So why'd you do it? Actually, you know, if I'm really honest, I think I, I just, I wanted to win, you know, really. And it was just a, the greatest scene, you know, I just wanted to, just wanted to win. Today, for the first time, I met someone who actually knew Matthew Shepard. Trish Steger, owner of a shop in town, referred to him as Matt. Matt used to come into my shop. That's how I knew him. It was the first time I ever heard him referred to as Matt instead of Matthew. Well, what was he like? I don't know, you know. How does any one person ever tell about another? Matt was a blunt little shit. You know what I'm saying? And he's a little guy, 5'2", soaking wet, I bet you, 97 pounds tops. I mean, they were saying he weighed 110 pounds. I don't believe it. I say, are you Matthew Shepard? And he says, yeah. 
I'm Matthew Shepard, but I don't want you to call me Matthew or Mr. Shepard. Don't call me none of that. My name is Matt. And I want you to know that I am gay and we're going to be going to a gay bar. Do you have a problem with that? I said, no. How are you paying? Okay, because the fact of the matter is, Laramie doesn't have any gay bars. Well, for that matter, neither does Wyoming. You see, he was hiring me to take him down to Fort Collins, Colorado, which is about an hour away. He was struggling when he first came here, reaching out, trying to, trying to fit in. I'm sorry, I'm late. Hi, my sister Romaine. She was a close friend of Matthew's. Matthew really wanted to get into political affairs. That was all his big interest was watching CNN and MSNBC. Those are the only TV stations I ever saw his TV tune into. So why did he move to Laramie? He told me he was thinking about going back to school. So I told him, go to the University of Wyoming. Go to Laramie. You can really find a home there. I was Matthew's academic advisor, so I knew him in a very specific context. But I can tell you that Matthew was very shy when he first came in. To the point of being somewhat mousy, I'd almost say. But soon, his shyness began to give way to this person that was excited about this track that he was going to embark on. Whenever I think of Matthew, I think of his incredible beaming smile. He'd walk into a room and just be like... <laughs> and he'd smile at everyone. And he made you feel great. He was just starting to say, there are opportunities here. There are things I can do in this world. I can be important. I heard from Matt about 48 hours before the attack. Uh, and he told me he'd just joined the gay and lesbian group on campus. And, and he was really enjoying it, getting ready for Pride Week and whatnot. He was totally stoked about school. He was really happy being there. I can only say this in retrospect, of course. I think that's where he was headed, towards human rights. Let me tell you something here. There's more gay people in Wyoming than meets the eye. You think? I know. I know for a fact. I mean, they're not particularly, uh, what do you call the queens, the gay people? Queens. You know, the run-around faggot type people. I mean, they're more like, you know, the ones who throw a bale of hay, jump on a horse, brand them, and kick ass. You know what I'm saying? I mean, as I always say, you don't fuck with a Wyoming queer because they'll fucking kick you in your ass. But that's not the point of what I'm saying. What is the point? The people of Wyoming do not give a damn one way or the other if you're gay, if you're straight, if you're bisexual, trisexual, it doesn't matter. Really? That's what I just said, it doesn't matter. I was the first out lesbian or gay faculty member, and that's in 1992, so that's not that long ago. They asked me at the interview what my husband did, so, you know, I came out then. When I first moved out here, I knew it was going to be hard as a gay man, and there would be times, you know, I would go down to Denver, and I would go to the, to the gay bars there, and people would ask me where I was from, and I would say, Laramie, Wyoming, and I met so many men down there from Wyoming. So many gay men who grew up here and they are like, this is not a place where I can live. How can you live there? I had to get out. But every once in a while, there'd be a guy, oh gosh, I miss Laramie. I mean, I really love it there. That's where I want to live. And they get this starry-eyed look and I think if that is where you want to live, do it. So I get into my office one day and I have a message to call this woman back. So I call her back and she goes, I hear you are a lesbian. I hear you are one. And I'm like, uh-huh, you know? She goes, I'm one too. She wanted to come over and meet me immediately. She also warned me about the fact that there's other lesbians in this town who would not be seen with me. That just to be seen with me would taint them irreparably. That just to be seen with me would be a big problem. I love this land. I mean, I really love this land. Okay, I'm gonna make
make this brief, quick. Just get it over with, but it will be everything. Factual, just the facts. 10 o'clock, I punch in my regular time for Tuesdays. And 10.30, we're having karaoke night that night, so there's maybe 20 or 30 people milling around in here. That's when Matthew Shepard comes in alone. He comes in and uh, he actually sits right where you're sitting right now. Orders himself a Heineken. So what can I tell you about Matt? What? Manners, politeness, intelligence, taking care of me, has in tips. Not everything, he just offers conversation. He comes in, he's always dressed real nice, clean cut. Didn't seem to have any worries. It wasn't like he was waiting on anybody. He just wanted to enjoy his drink and the company around. And I guess it was maybe 11.30, 11.45, that's when Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney came in. They come in, they approach the bar, they sit right here, they order a pitcher, and as you know, they pay for the thing entirely in dimes and quarters, which, let me tell you, is something you just don't forget. I mean, you don't forget something like that. $5.50 in dimes and quarters, it's a freaking nightmare for a bartender. Money meant nothing to Matthew, because he grew up with a lot of it. And he'd have handed over his wallet in a second, because money meant nothing to him. I mean, his shoes might have meant something, but they can say it was robbery all they want to. But I don't buy it. Not even for an iota of a second. Look, when they came in, Henderson and McKinney, you know, to me, they didn't seem to be, they weren't intoxicated at all. They came right in, they ordered a pitcher of beer, take it back there into the pool area, and they pretty much just kept to themselves. It was probably going on for about a half an hour, and then I noticed that Russell and Aaron had been talking with Matthew Shepard. Some people are saying he made a pass at them. Well, hell, you don't pick up regular people. Aaron and I have been together for two years. And Aaron said that a guy walked up to him and said he was gay and wanted to get with him and Russ. And Aaron's really bad about that. He doesn't like to be around gay people at all, and neither does Russ. They just don't like them at all. And so he got aggravated with it and said that he was straight and he didn't want to have anything to do with it, and he walked off. And he said that's when him and Russ went into the bathroom and decided to pretend that they were gay and get him in the truck and rob him. They wanted to teach him a lesson not to come on to straight people. I'm not excusing their actions, but it seems to be partially his fault and partially the guys who did it. So, you know, it maybe it's 50-50. They stated that Matt came on to them, that he approached them. I absolutely, positively disbelieve and refute that statement 100%. But I'll give you two reasons why. One, character reference. Why would he approach them? Why them? I mean, he wasn't approaching anyone else in the bar, okay? So, I mean, they say he's gay, right? That he was a flaming gay, so he's just gonna come on to people like that. Bullshit, he never came on to me. I mean, hello, come on. He's gonna approach these two guys, please. And two, territorialism. Matt was sitting there. Aaron and Russell were back there. Upon their first interaction, they were in Matt's area, the area that he had been seen sitting all night long. So who approached who by that? He'd never not talk to someone for any reason. If someone started talking to him, he'd just be like, oh, blah, 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 blah. He had no problem just striking up a conversation with anybody. So this is what I'm going to be testifying to because, you know, basically I'm like the key eyewitness in the case. Basically, I'm going to be testifying that I saw Matthew leave. I saw two individuals leave with Matthew Shepard, and I didn't see their faces, but I did see the back of their heads, and at the same time, McKinney and Henderson are no longer around, so you do the math. 